Throughout the history of this country, it has been an honored profession, the service of one's country, by enlisting or becoming an officer in one of the branches of our military forces. One man in our history who made the military service his very life, the substance of his soul, the service to his country, was General Douglas MacArthur. He is a man who was loved by many, many people in this country, and he is remembered to this day. He was a man who was caught between the coming of a new age and what he had been taught that was the old age. He was a man who was to lead troops into the battle of really the last great war that was really fought for a purpose. A purpose that everyone in the world knew and recognized and understood. Harry Truman had signed the United Nations Treaty and the Senate had ratified it. He had also signed and passed into law the United Nations Participation Act. And it was those two acts, really, which sealed the fate of General Douglas MacArthur. For you see, by that act, we were relegated to fighting small wars for reasons other than the, what the public would ever understand. Wars designed to bring about a new world order. A world ruled by a United Nations in a world propelled toward the destruction of sovereignty of nations. General MacArthur did not understand that at the time. And indeed, many of us who live today don't understand it. He didn't know how to fight a holding action. He didn't know how to stop at an arbitrary line when the enemy was routed in defeat. He didn't know how to lose a war on purpose. And for that reason, he was fired. I think eventually he came to understand it, however, and I think that you will be able to hear that in this speech. The speech that he delivered before the Corps of Cadets of the United States Military Academy at West Point on May 12, 1962, his alma mater. We see General Douglas MacArthur was a member of the Long Gray Line. He was there to accept the Sylvanus Thayer Award for service to his nation. The general spoke without a prepared address, without even notes. And yet this moving address commits to words as never before the creed of the Long Gray Line. Indeed, it does much more than that. It honors with eloquence the American soldier, his courage, his sacrifice, and his deeds. General Westmoreland, General Groves, Distinguished guests and gentlemen of the Corps, as I was leaving the hotel this morning, a doorman asked me, where are you bound for, General? And when I replied West Point, he remarked, Beautiful place. Have you ever been there before? <laughs> no human being could fail to be deeply moved by such a tribute as this. Coming 
from a profession I have served so long and a people I have loved so well, it fills me with an emotion I cannot express. But this award is not intended primarily to honor a personality, but to symbolize a great moral code. The code of conduct and chivalry of those who guard this beloved land of culture and ancient descent. That is the animation of this medallion. For all eyes and for all time, it is an expression of the ethics of the American soldier that I should be integrated in this way with so noble an ideal arouses a sense of pride and yet of humility which will be with me always. Duty, honor, country. Those three hallowed words reverently dictate what you ought to be, what you can be, what you will be. They are your rallying points to build courage when courage seems to fail, to regain faith when there seems to be little cause for faith, to create hope when hope becomes forlorn. Unhappily, I possess neither that eloquence of diction, that poetry of imagination, nor that brilliance of metaphor to tell you all that they mean. The unbeliever will say they are but words, but a slogan, but a flamboyant phrase. Every pedant, every demagogue, every cynic, every hypocrite, every troublemaker, and I am sorry to say some others of an entirely different character will try to downgrade them even to the extent of mockery and ridicule. But these are some of the things they do. They build your basic character. They mold you for your future roles as the custodians of the nation's defense. They make you strong enough to know when you are weak and brave enough to face yourself 
when you are a friend. They teach you to be proud and unbending in honest failure, but humble and gentle in success. Not to substitute words for action, not to seek the path of comfort, but to face the stress and spur of difficulty and challenge, to learn to stand up in the storm, but to have compassion on those who fall, to master yourself before you seek to master others, to have a heart that is clean, a goal that is high, to learn to laugh, but yet never forget how to weep, to reach into the future, yet never neglect the past, to be serious, yet never to take ourselves too seriously. To be modest, so that you will remember the simplicity of true greatness, the open mind of true wisdom, the meekness of true strength. They give you a temper of the will, a quality of the imagination, a vigor of the emotions, a freshness of the deep springs of life a temperamental predominance of courage over timidity, of an appetite for adventure over love of ease. They create in your heart the sense of wonder, the unfailing hope of what next and the joy and inspiration of life. They teach you in this way to be an officer and a gentleman. And what sort of soldiers Are those you are to lead? Are they reliable? Are they brave? Are they capable of victory? Their story is known to all of you. It is the story of the American man at arms. My estimate of him was formed on the battlefield many, many years ago and has never changed. I regarded him then as I regard him now, as one of the world's noblest figures, not only as one of the finest military characters, but also as one of the most stainless. His name and fame are the birthright of every American citizen in his youth and strength. 
his love and loyalty. He gave all that mortality can give. He needs no eulogy from me or from any other man. He has written his own history and written it in red on his enemy's breast. But when I think of his patience under adversity, of his courage under fire, and of his modesty and victory, I am filled with an emotion of admiration I cannot put into words. He belongs to history as furnishing one of the greatest examples of successful patriotism. He belongs to posterity as the instructor of future generations in the principles of liberty and freedom. He belongs to the present, to us, by his virtues and by his achievements. In 20 campaigns, on a hundred battlefields, around a thousand campfires, I have witnessed that enduring fortitude, that patriotic self-abnegation, and that invincible determination which have carved his statue in the hearts of his people. From one end of the world to the other, he has drained deep the chalice of courage. As I listen to those songs, in memory's eye, I could see those staggering columns of the First World War bending under soggy packs on many a weary march. From dripping dust to drizzling dawn, slogging ankle deep through the mire of shell shock roads to form grimly for the attack, blue lipped, covered with sludge and mud, chilled by the wind and rain, driving home to their objective, and for many to the judgment seat of God. I do not know the dignity of their birth, but I do know the glory of their death. They died unquestioning, uncomplaining, with faith in their hearts and on their lips the hope that we would go on to victory. Always for them duty, honor, country. Always their blood and sweat and tears as we sought the way and the light and the truth. 
And 20 years after, on the other side of the globe, again, the filth of murky foxholes, the stench of ghostly trenches, the slime of dripping dugouts, those broiling suns of relentless heat, those torrential rains of devastating storm, the loneliness and utter desolation of jungle trails, the bitterness of long separation from those they loved and cherished, the deadly pestilence of tropical disease, the horror of stricken areas of war, their resolute and determined defense, their swift and sure attack, their indomitable purpose, their complete and decisive victory, always victory, always through the bloody haze of their last reverberating shot, the vision of gaunt, ghastly men reverently following your password of duty, honor, country. The code which those words perpetuate embraces the highest moral laws and will stand the test of any ethics or philosophies ever promulgated for the uplift of mankind. Its requirements are for the things that are right, and its restraints are from the things that are wrong. The soldier above all other men, is required to practice the greatest act of religious training, sacrifice, in battle and in the face of danger and death, he discloses those divine attributes which his Maker gave when he created man in his own image. No physical courage and no brute instinct can take the place of the divine help which alone can sustain him. However horrible the incidents of war may be, the soldier who is called upon to offer and to give his life for his country is the noblest development of mankind.